Richard Borchard posted a video today. I strongly advise to go to his channel. I'm going to put the link in the description and in the comments. Go to watch his today video because he explained certain aspects of the reflections and the mathematics which I showed you in the simulations. So if you want to understand these subjects more, is the best place to visit. As I said before, I built different lattice systems in different dimensions. I spoke about ADS CFT and string theory. I spoke about electromagnetism. Now in the last video, I spoke about a boundary problem which correspond to electrostatics on the disk. In terms of the past videos, at this point, I disconnect from the analogs. So, I'm strictly speak about the universe as a system and I'm going to constrain the model to the simplest possible element. The reason why I'll do this because any extension or scaling or introducing any other constraint to the system going to apply a boundary condition which you not necessarily want. So what do I mean by this? If I put this system on the lattice, I'm going to create a certain boundary condition which correspond to the lattice spacing. What is the structure of my lattice? And because of this, it's going to influence the dynamics of the model itself. Theory of quantum gravity is not a lattice model. It has to have absolute minimum description. When you take a look at this lecture by Richard, he speaks about E8. Many times shows up in unified field theories. Attempt a uni unification based on the E8 lattice. The E8 lattice is a 248-dimensional object. At least the description in terms of degrees of freedom you see the image of the E8 here. Now, when you study topology and you work with manifolds, you pick up some knowledge about how to tile surfaces. For instance, if you want to represent a torus, the smallest possible tiling, what you can do and use is a triangle. In other words, you can represent the surface of the torus by tiling with triangles. When you start adding more and more angles, you're going to essentially refine your mesh or your surface, and your surface is going to become smoother and smoother. The more angles the tiles individually get, the entire torus topology will be smoother and smoother until a certain point you reach almost a curve. Now, when you do this tiling, essentially you create vertices which correspond to these angles and you have points on these angles. When you look at the torus from the top, you essentially see something like a sphere on the z-axis. So you look at down on the sphere or on the torus. Now, what you have to understand is this. When you take a sphere and you look at from the x and the y axis, the sphere is going to be identical. However, it's not going to be identical from the z axis. If you try to represent space time in the same formalism, such as x, y, and z axis, it indicates to you that the x and the y axis is identical and the z axis is not. Now, when you add a projection, to these axes, what is going to happen is that the x and the y axis is no longer going to be identical. The information in terms of geometry 
now is going to change. So the x and the y and the z axis all going to be different and contain different representation of the geometry. When you look at the E8 lattice, which supposed to be 248 dimensional, what you essentially see is a two dimensional disk. This two dimensional disk contains the X and the Y axis, including the projections on the same disk. I can show you this by showing the torus from the side. When you see this image, you see the torus from the side. When you add the projections to the X and the Y axis, it's going to reflect to the other axis. So the information, which originally should be a limited topology, is going to change. So when you look at the E8, you look at a torus contains projections or mirror symmetries and the vertices, what you see on the boundary, on the circle or the very edge of the torus is the projection points from the axes. In other words, the E8 is the sum of the Z, X and Y axis mirrors in terms of vertices. When you adjust the fineness of the mesh, you're going to, in a sense, reduce the topology and these vertices or points, what you see highlighted on the E8, is going to reduce to a smaller group. To understand this better, I have to explain to you about how the phase changes the topology. You see these torus here. You see that the hole at the center correspond to a circle which give you this boundary condition. The height of the torus is correspond to the other circle which going to contribute to what the height of the torus going to be. If you change the angle which is changing the phase of this circle which correspond with the height, you're going to make your torus flat. If you change the angle to be completely aligned with the circle at the, at the hole or, or the boundary, you're going to have a um, pancake with a hole. In other words, you're going to have a disc. Now, this disc is two-dimensional and is going to contain two boundaries. One is the outer circle and the other one is the inside circle. If you start to interpolate the angle, you're going to change the phase and now the torus is going to get height and with that it's going to become three-dimensional. When you look at the E8 geometry, you see this torus where the thickness or the height of the torus contains the projections from the X and the Y axis. In other words, the E8 is not a 248 dimensional object, it is a three dimensional object which represented on a two dimensional disk, which contains all degrees of freedom of a three dimensional object, contains the vertices and the topology of the tiling. Many people making a mistake to take these higher dimensions as real, but now I'm going to show you why higher dimensions doesn't exist. And if you try to work your way forward higher dimensions, you're going to run into problems which you cannot fix. You have to understand the topology of real physical world. When we go back to this torus and we take the phase angle to zero, as I said, you're going to have a disk. Now, this disk is correspond to this boundary volume problem, which correspond to this electrostatics. Because you have a manifold which is going to show you the deformations. Once you deform this disk, it's going to create a tension in this disk which corresponds to bifurcation. So the disk, in a sense, get twisted. And because of this get twisted, you're going to have certain consequences because of this deformation. Now, you can ask the question, what causes the disk to deform. Well, it can be 
either heating or the disc is heated up and get deformed or it can have mechanical deformation. Now because this disc is correspond to electromagnetism, now we have to derive how these two is related. When you look at these images, you can see the galaxies. And you can see all of them correspond to this disk. Now the problem is that you don't see this disk. You don't see physical disk there. But you can see that all matter is confined or gauged in a sense to this disk. As you can see, there is a black hole at the center. Now when you have a hole at the center of your disk, and it corresponds to a black hole at the center of the galaxy, you want to ask this question, what is a black hole? Now, as I said before, the black hole is correspond to electromagnetic flux. And you can ask this question, how do you derive this flux on the disk? Well, you see, you have charges which confined in the inner boundary of this torus or circle. Because if you look at the disk only, the inner boundary of this hole, it can trap charges which can orbit. When you do this, in a two dimension, the orbital motion is just a one dimensional movement. So, even though you can think in terms of the charge moving on a straight line, essentially is confined in a circle. There is a deep connection between straight lines and deformation because the angular momentum is correspond to the straight lines get deformed. If you thinking about what is the origin of angular momentum, you can derive the angular momentum by deforming a straight pathway. And this is what happens with the light rays, which I showed you previously. Even though the trajectory is originally a straight, going to change this pathway and it creates angular momentum. As I showed you before, in some cases, the evolution of this angular momentum breaks down and you have a completely different system state. When you change the height of this flat disk, in other words, you deform this disk, is going to resonate. So its position going to tilt compared to its original position. The reason why is important because now the one dimensional orbit which is confined in the hole it can move in three dimensions because of this deformation in other words the orbits going to change what matters is that how much this disk is deformed when you look at the milky way galaxy it has been found that milky way galaxy have this deformation when i started studying this model of quantum gravity on a color manifold. I realized that any time I do a render, I can see that something is off because the horizontal line is tilted. And I tried to correct this manually, but I couldn't. So you can see on these images, there is a slight tilt on the right hand side of the horizontal plane. So you can see a slight slope on the horizontal axis. Now when you go to this image, which is the Bose-Einstein condensate, you can see the laser beams coming in a cross. And you see the horizontal line, which correspond to the mirrors. One side is fixed, the other is moving. And an external field. Now what you see on this horizontal axis, the right hand side is tilted. Now if you add this tilt to every single object, you can understand why the Earth and everything else have this tilt. Because these disks are deformed. So even though you don't see the disk of the Earth, in terms of the physics of it, is based on this. So even if you give a height to the torus, it's still going to be tilted because of the deformation. So you can see a spherical object and you can identify a tilt which is correspond to this deformation, regardless, spherical or not. But I explain to you, based on this disk.
because if I tell you that you have a spherical object and you deform this spherical object, it's going to be tilted. You won't understand. If I explain to you through the disc and how the disc is deformed and create the resonance because of this deformation, then you understand it better. Now, in terms of charges, you can have the same boundary problem with many holes on this disc. When you want to associate these two physical phenomenon, what is the closest description what we can have? Well, we can have in particle physics, which is related to condensed matter physics, particle hole symmetry. In fact, the high energy physics of electron positron pair have an analog in condensed matter physics where the electron have a hole as a representation of the positron. In the same time, you can find these holes as vortex in different condensate. In other words, you can represent these charges as vortex, different type. You can have, for instance, skirmions. But as I said, I don't want to use the analog from condensed matter physics, but good to be aware of and understand what physical description you can gain from condensed matter physics. So it gives you more insight what this system looks like. But I don't want to use this analogy because based on how I see it, in my framework, there is only electromagnetism, nothing else. The reason why? Because if I think in terms of helium and vortices, superfluidity, now I am on the level of atoms where I don't want to be. As I said, I want to minimize this framework to the smallest possible component. And this is what I showed you, which correspond to this disk, geometric representation of electromagnetism. Now, I showed you this picture in the last video. I told you to pay attention to the components. You have the blue and the red sector. This is the geometry of electromagnetism, which correspond to a specific phase relationship between the electromagnetic components in time evolution. I told you that pay attention because you have disk representation like the galaxies, but you also have the blue component which is going in a different axis. I told you as well that the electromagnetism is a superposition of the same identity. Even we see two different manifestations correspond to spatial coordinates. What you want to pay attention to is the difference in terms of geometry between the two components. As you can see, the red correspond to Euclidean geometry, but the blue is correspond to Minkowski space. What you can understand from this is that when you try to do quantum gravity model based on Euclidean geometry or based on the general relativity using Minkowski space, you're using only the one component of the story because, as you can see, these two is simultaneously present in time evolution. So you simultaneously have the Minkowski description and you have the Euclidean description, but they represent a different component of electromagnetism. You also want to pay attention to the difference between the blue and the red sectors. Even though we have reflections or projections, the independent component are not projecting towards each other. They have a completely different geometric or evolution. So as you can see, you have the disk formalism, but the blue sector doesn't represent this disk. It has a completely different geometric interpretation. So in a sense, your theory of quantum gravity has to contain the Minkowski and the Euclidean description in the same time. And you have to connect this two description into one framework. But I told you this in the previous video, that you have two field theory, which in a sense gauged without global symmetry. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the x, y and z axis geometric or evolution with time is not the same. In other words, you cannot apply a z axis symmetry on the x or the y axis. Why is this crucial? 
because when you think in terms of non-commutivity, you can make a statement such as 2 plus 2 is 4. You can make a statement such as 1 plus 3 is 4. You can make a statement such as 3 plus 1 is 4. I make three different statements, but all of them have the same exact result. Each and every case, the resulting number is 4, but each of them contains different elements. When you think in terms of non-commutivity, it tells you that the 2 plus 2 and the 1 plus 3 is not the same. Even if you have the same results as 4, the symmetry of the components are not the same. You can ask this, why does this matter when you have, in all three cases, the exact same result? The reason why this matters, because you can have a net zero charge, but you can have different components. You can have an electron and positron, or you can have fractional statistics and cancel that out to have net zero charge. You understand? So there is a deep connection between non-commutivity and the physical reality, how we see it. Now, there is a big problem in terms of quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. How we see the world, how we experience the world, and how the quantum behaves. When you look at this picture, what you see is a momentum. You can see how the momentum looks like. You see as an amplitude, in a sense. You can represent this with a wave function. The issue is that when you throw a ball or kick a ball, you don't see this amplitude. You understand? So you describe momentum with an amplitude, but in your physical reality, you don't see momentum. What you experience is the change between the object in space, and you associate the momentum based on how this spatial translation is happening. But when you look at the wave function and you look at the amplitude, it's a completely different description compared to what you experience. So someone throw a ball at you, you catch this ball, you experience momentum, but you don't see it as an amplitude. You derive it from positions in space and the relationship between points. So what's the difference? Why is not compatible? The reason why these two is incompatible because you bound it to physical space and you derive momentum from the relationships in physical space. In other words, you observe physical space, but reality happens in momentum space. You cannot interpret momentum space without physical space. All your information, what you gain, has a physical consequence. The reality, as you call it, is happens in momentum space, not physical space. And this is why quantum mechanics and general relativity is incompatible, but each of them valid in its domain. But the important point is, when you gauged to this disk, and as I said, you reach the escape velocity, and you're breaking this gauge, you don't have this gauge force or gauge potential on you anymore. However, at certain proximity, which correspond to degrees of freedom, this gauge potential or gauge force going to act on you. And this is why you experience gravity. So what you have to understand is that when you are confined on a disk, you obey certain physical principles. But when you able to break this gauge, then you're going to be subjected to different physics. Now, this system doesn't require physical space, in a sense. You can have multiple disks on top of each other, and as you can see on the picture, you're going to have this notion of expansion based on this electrostatic repulsion.